Welcome back to another episode of the Stag Rule Podcast. This is episode 315. And before we get into it, I just want to shout out to the couple of subscribers to the newsletter of late. Um, we managed to punch out a couple of those in the start of the year, and it's good to see that the numbers of subscribers to that are growing. Uh, it's just a cheeky newsletter of the, some of the things that I've been up to and some of the products and things that I've been using that you might like to use yourself. Um, and yeah, so if you'd like to subscribe to that, the link is the first link there in the show notes. Anyway, we are massively privileged to have Michael Brake on the podcast. Michael was part of the New Zealand Men's 8 at the Tokyo Olympics, of course delayed a year to 2021. Um, if you want to know a little bit more about their story, I've added the links to a couple of awesome YouTube videos. Um, one of them is a speech by Sean Kirkham, another member of the eight. He was a member of that eight for uh, I think 10 years, something like that. And, um, and the other one is a story which Michael and Sean are both a part of, um, is about Tony O'Connor, the coach of the eight no relation um although he's irish my heritage is irish so maybe we are but highly doubt it <laughs> um yeah so the links to those are in the show notes uh michael's had a massive journey in high performance sport um he went to bulgaria with well man actually uh, separate crews but back in the day and had early victory and then it's just that painstaking massive commitment year after year um yeah another sort of 10 or 11 years for that one moment, that Olympic gold at Tokyo. So, hell of a story, hell of a man, and uh, he's not done yet. Exciting stuff to come from Michael Brake, so make sure you're following him on Instagram. Um, as he says, he's hoping to get out there and talk a bit more, so if you're someone that uh, is looking for a speaker after this, uh, he would be a good person to book for your function. Right, without further ado, let's get into this episode. Awesome one with Michael Brake. six times in the last couple of months and haven't seen a single thing <laughs> and in areas where in the past I've always seen something you know yeah and I've just felt so robbed because every time I've taken someone as well I've, and I've been like man this spot's so good <laughs> and then they're like oh yeah man to, to farms or what uh, yeah it's, it's all farms yeah that's the that's the where you want to go should we just kick into it and be recorded yeah, yeah sweet <laughs> yeah that's where you want to take someone, eh? Like, my stepdaughter wants to go hunting this year, and I'm like, oh. Then there's some farmers. <laughs> Don't want to take her for a walk, walk, long walk. Even even going rabbit shooting or something would be good. Yeah. You just want something with a, with a ridge that you can just drive up to and, and pop over and have a look down? Well, near where um, Paddy McInnes, his old man is, my mate. That's how. Yeah, in yeah. Hawke's Bay. My mate has a neighbouring farm, and yeah, there's good deer numbers in there. There's yeah. heaps down there. Every, every time I ask Paddy how's Dad's doing, it oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> Dad said there's heaps of deer out at the moment. <laughs> oh, I'm devastated. I recorded a podcast with Paddy a couple of months ago before he went back to Ireland. Oh yeah. Nice two hour conversation. It was like logged and everything and I was like, oh sweet, bloody brilliant. Yeah. Then I went to upload it and there was just no sound. Like I said there was sound but there just no, no sound came back so... It was devastating. Gutted. He's always got a good story. <laughs> oh, yeah, like I said, we we yarned for ages. We talked about his um, car tour that he did through bloody... Mongol Rally. Yeah, Mongol Rally. <laughs> <laughs> you could do two hours on that from some of the stories I've heard, but yeah, I don't know how many you'd, you'd want to hear on a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then him, him and the Irishman, yeah, that was good stuff. Yeah. Did you did you train with the Irish fellas? Um, Gary and Paul. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, when they were, they were over in New Zealand... Both of them, plus two other guys, came over. Yeah. There was four of them. They were over for a season, and that was good fun. Um, trained with them alongside them, kind of, on Carapero. And then Gary came back the year after. Mm. Um, but broke his broke his arm. Oh, shit. Yeah, it was a bummer. I think a couple of weeks in, he, he came off his bike and 
then he was in a foreign country with a broken arm. Going, oh, yeah. Geez, what am I doing here? So, yeah, a bit of a sad ending that one. That's good segue. But, how do you, how did you break your wrist? How did I break mine? Um, so the, the the first injury, uh, the first serious injury for my wrist was um, it was three days back into training after we got back from the Rio Olympics. Yeah. So with the rowing team, we usually have about three weeks off after a world champ. So it's just enough time to kind of um, you know mentally refresh and 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 then come back ready to get get going again. Mm-hmm. Um, but after the Olympics, you get three months. Nice. So because we kind of with rowing, it's it is very uh, heavily oriented towards the Olympics. You, yeah. You're focusing on that throughout a four year cycle, and so you kind of you build, 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 and then the Olympics happens, and you, at that point, you've you've usually had a pretty intense year leading into it. So they give you a lot of time off, which is great. So just on that, what what does it mean to be world champion? Um. I'm actually not a world champion. I was going to say, you've got, a, you've got you've yeah. <laughs> yeah, you got silver. You're that asking feel? the wrong person. How did uh, that feel it, being silver? Well, it feel, uh, yeah, good. Yeah, I guess. Um, did uh, you sort of decompartmentalize it? It's like you got the job done. You qualified the boat. We qualified the boat before the final, so right. we, we qualified the boat in our semi-final. So, yeah, with with that world champs event that we got the silver at. That was also, like you say, a qualification regatta for the Olympics. Um, by making it into the final, mm-hmm. we'd qualified it for the Olympics. So the job was done before the final. Um, and what we saw in the quarters and the semis was some of the tightest racing that mm-hmm. I've ever done in my life. It was the quarterfinal, it was between first and fourth, it was first through to third getting through, and fourth and sixth being knocked out. Mm. Uh, first to fourth, it was. Uh, a two second difference bow, bow, over yeah. yeah over a six minute race mm-hmm. and then in the semi-final i think it was a half a second <laughs> between first and fourth shit yeah and then when it got to the final um there was like four or five seconds between each boat so it was like first and then four seconds to us and then another few seconds to third and it com- completely spread out so yeah i think everyone was doing the same thing they were just absolutely redlining to try and get that olympic qualification, qualification. and and then kind of come off a wee bit, but getting the silver was awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, my story was similar to a lot of the guys around that time, um, where there was a bit of early success with um, some age group uh, events. Uh, so in 2012, I went overseas with with um, a good group of guys, and we won the juniors. Mm-hmm. That was our first time travelling, and we won that. And so um, early success was great. It got me hooked, but um, became quite hard to replicate mm. uh, that was that's my only world uh, title uh, world championship title was mm-hmm. under 19s because we then went on to under 23s and, and got a, a silver which was also you know, a, a great result um, but then it was a bunch of you know at best thirds at world cups and then a lot of we got a lot of six places which <laughs> in rowing was last in the a final yeah so you're the, the worst of the best um, and then, yeah, so to get back on the podium at the World Champs, or to get on the podium at the World Champs was, was awesome. Good feeling again. Uh, it was a very good feeling, yeah. It was, um, yeah, like any high-level sport, it's just a sign that the systems that you got in place and the processes yeah. are paying off. So three years back, you're getting a three-month break. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we're getting yeah. So after after Rio, uh, three month break, and then three days. Everything happened in threes around that time. Mm-hmm. Um, three month break, and then three days in, um, we were just finishing off a row. I was rowing with with Sean Kirkham. He's a good mate, and um, I'm sure we might touch on him a bit later. We're doing a bit more in rowing. We're both coming out of retirement somewhat, um, which we could talk about later. Yeah. Um, we were out in a, in a pier and we did a, a little exercise 100 metres from the pontoon. So we'd, we'd just done a, an hour and a half row, it's about uh, 16 kilometres. And we're 100 metres out and we, we're just doing a little technical exercise that is incredibly light and, and shouldn't do anything. Hmm. You know, shouldn't shouldn't be high risk at all. And um, I just ha- ended up having a bit of a freak tweak of my wrist. And I thought, that's weird. Um, went in and it was completely inflamed. It was It ended up being uh, decoivins. Uh, it's uh, intersection tendonitis so it was, it was the start of a tendonitis anyway and, and, I, and I didn't rest adequately and, and so that just continued the inflammation process and, 
and basically um, that stopped me from uh, in rowing it's feathering mm -hmm. squaring the wrist so turning the wrist to to uh, turn the, the blade from yeah. the position that it goes into the water to the position that it's in when it's out of the water mm. it, it does that twist uh, and turn with each stroke um, so I couldn't do that um, I was out I was in and out of the boat with that it, it wasn't a, a straightforward process um, could you run the other side or no? I couldn't run the other side no, no. It's, it'd be like um, no, it'd be like learning to run backwards it's, <laughs> uh, it's, it's uh, yeah. it, it, it takes at, at that level it takes usually a good row over a year to transition properly or, mm -hmm. or at least a season so six months um, but it, my wrist was still buggered yeah um, so it, t it took a it took a, a month or so to get back in the boat, um, and then as soon as I got back in the boat, the I think it might have been the same row, or it might have been three three rows later. Everything was happening in threes around then, um, and I did my other wrist same mm -hmm. thing, um, and that kind of came down to um, I'd now not done anything for a month mm -hmm. rowing related. I'd been on the bike doing cross training the whole time. Um, so then jumping back in the boat and trying to go straight to full volume having not done any build up with my forearms and, and wrists and so I blew up the other one um, there was n nothing else around it like stress or no, no you were feeling no, pretty it, good it was well, I, I, was, I was feeling fine I just probably pushed the pace a bit hard coming back from a from, break from, from an, an now even longer break a four month break really off using the wrists um, and yeah so, so I was out with that wrist and it took about six months because you don't you don't always go well in sport you try and take the the least Lawson invasive that, the least yeah. inva least invasive path for for coming back from an injury so initially it was rest mm. and then it was anti-inflammatories and then it was a, a cortisone and and each time I'm, I'm taking a bit of time to do that process and then trying to come back and going okay no it's, it's bad so we'll, it's so are you dealing with the sports doctor or are you going to like a wrist specialist as well started just trying to go physio you be right <laughs> yeah. started with just just physio um and then from there it was you know, we need we need the doctor's help and then from there i ended up with both of them getting surgery on them yeah um, and it was a relatively simple surgery um we ended up going private to speed it up do you know what they did yeah, they, they they get in and they they cut the, so the the cause of of that injury is you get scar tissue under the fascia yeah around the tendon and so every time you move it uh, the, the that injury is known for creaking because you've got scar tissue inside the fascia that's that's rubbing that's my understanding anyway yeah, I, sounds I'm, I'm no sounds doctor. sounds like something that but, causes a problem <laughs> yeah yeah so they just they just get in and they cut the fascia and then they take out the scar tissue and when it, uh, I don't know if it joins back up or whatever, but you, when you've had the surgery, it's meant to be, you're done. You, mm -hmm. you, you're in the clear. Yeah. Go on, and you, and you shouldn't be able to get the injury again. Um, and so I had the surgery uh, three days after we decided, so it was quite a quick path to treatment. And then as soon as the, wound, the wounds had closed over, so I wasn't at risk of infection, I could row again and, and there was no issues. Mm -hmm. So it was like once we finally got to that, that step of having surgery, um, about 10 days later I was... Back to full capacity yeah yeah but a frustrating journey to get there and so i was reading the adventure frustration you did like 450k's on like a what bike or some some crazy shit <laughs> yeah yeah there was yeah well all, all i could do was ride yeah um and i was determined not to not to come back unfit so i thought shit um what i what i worked out was that because i was training on my own mm -hmm. um i didn't have to were you part of the team still? I was still yeah. part of the team, and I, and I was quite lucky to be looked after by the team and, and not just be... Um, cast you know, aside. <laughs> cast, cast aside, which, which yeah, can happen in some situations in some teams. But um, I was looked after well um, and you know reassured that I'd, I'd get my shot when, I was, when the body was good. Um, I worked out, though, with, with kind of being on, on, on the side on my own and doing my own program... Um, I thought Should I, I better find a, a silver lining to this um, yeah. and my silver lining was that uh, I didn't have to um, taper for these, these little selection events that, mm -hmm. that everyone else had to, had to go through because I was kind of on my own recovery path at this point and so not needing to freshen up every you know, three, four weeks, whatever for, for, for an ERG test or, or for a, a 2K race, mm -hmm. I could just put myself further and further in the hole to then pop up Hopefully, so did you stay with the physiologist or yeah i worked yeah. with the physiologist on this and, and, and i was on my own program 
Um, but I was kind of, I guess I was, I was testing my own limits of overtraining yeah. <laughs> um, on the bike, and and it ended up working. Um, after six months on the bike, you know, we did some, I did some pretty nasty sessions that year. Um, the following year, which which I guess we'll get to in a second, um, spent spent that on the bike as well, and and pushed it even more. But um, ended up coming back quite fit, fitter than um, yeah. fitter than I thought I was going to be, I guess, and 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 earned a seat straight into the men's eight for world champs. Um, oh. Missed all the world cups with injury, <laughs> and, then, and then came into the the men's eight and um, was actually quite fit. So managed to pull a positive out of out of that situation, being on the bike for six months. What did you track? Like, as you say, you do massive volume over and over again, and you start feeling like pretty like knackered because you just want to be able to, as you say, taper it off and get back to pushing yeah. it out. But like, what did you what did you track over that time? Just watts or um, outputs or <laughs> day by day? It was it was tracking it was tracking watts. Yeah, um, I might get this dog collected though. She's <laughs> <laughs> wants to play. She wants to play. Yeah, she's saying, "Who's this? Let me, let me, someone someone fun in the house? Throw the ball." Um, so yeah, I mean, on each on each session we'd we'd track. Um, it'd be a lot of the, the training I was doing was low intensity. It was mm-hmm. you know you, you can't get through on some of the bigger days. You know, it was, it was zone two talked about back then or no? Yeah, we we had um, what do we call it. We had it, U three util- yeah. utilization three was what we, we used, and that was our, our low zone. Um, U two, um, and we would have like threshold, um, and then you know some max stuff as well, obviously. Mm-hmm. But um, the idea behind doing the extra volume was that I didn't have a heck of a lot of intensity. Uh, it was building up threshold, but it was more just just mind numbing, banging your head against a wall. <laughs> um, you know, your session for today is four hours. Oof. Oh, sweet. Could you still weight train or no? Yeah, I still did weight training. Yep, still yep. did still did full lower body weight training. So leg press. So I still I still had um, I still had a good bit of strength. All the upper body strength was gone. Mm. That was that was the hardest thing to to bring back. Could you? hold a barbell and squat or no um we did try that what did we do we did we did try back squats but i i, just, I felt quite uneasy because i couldn't really hold it with one hand yeah yeah, yeah. um depending on the hand as well yeah um i mean we i remember having uh, you know strength conditioning coaches holding it on my back so that it, did, it was just, it just got a bit dodgy because you became like a intensive resource like you, you three people come help me. <laughs> yeah, I was sucking all of the. Yeah, you're all, supposed to be training by all, yourself. All of the resources out of, <laughs> out of everyone in the building. Yeah, um, but <laughs> yeah, it, it wasn't actually like I, I obviously didn't do any. I didn't do a lot of rowing movement. Mm-hmm. Um, but luckily for me as a rower, the uh, cycling movement is it hits mm-hmm. most of the key muscles anyway. Um, and that year, r- did you set any sort of external goals or? Um, they'd give you a set time frame, and yeah, you knew yeah, you were going to be back then. They'd, they'd, they'd give me a pretty, a pretty clear. Once we, once I, once we decided that, or once it looked like we were going down the, the surgery route, um, we set, we set a pretty, pretty clear time frame, and, and, and kind of knew that it was going to be a couple of months. But yeah, um, while we were getting to that point, it was kind of every, every two weeks we go, okay, it's probably, you know, we'll, we'll take it by the next two weeks, and that was that was probably the most infuriating was was going fortnightly somewhat yeah um, but um, not knowing whether when we got there it would actually be good to go and how did you measure good to go did you have some sort of metric with that uh, we use the rowing machine most of the time so yeah. rather than you know I, I'd, I'd do a 20 minute session on the rowing machine and, and see if I felt it on my wrist and yeah most times it was yeah it's still causing pain <laughs> sweet and so and that's we, not even no, no, and it's just flat wrist. Yeah, and it's just flat wrist. So it was literally just the load through the forearms mm-hmm. on the tendons. Is that still hurting? Yes, it's still hurting. Cool. Two more weeks of biking. Fuck. Yeah. So it, it would come down every two weeks to doing twenty minutes on the rowing machine. Nope, it still hurts. Cool. That's two more weeks on the bike now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh dear. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was, it was. That, that was brutal. Yeah. Um, the next year, I, I did um, another wrist injury, um, but that was that was a much clearer you've got it's going to take three months to recover and mm-hmm. so we're like, okay cool we can we can plan for that now we can create a three-month program because you broke it right yeah yeah so yeah what were you doing um i was cleaning gutters yeah um and i fell off a roof basically. Pa- paid for cleaning gutters 
No. No? Fuck. It was, it, was, it was just for my parents. I was helping out with one of their rental properties. Oh, dear. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that happened, that happened the next year. So, yeah, um, got through got through the six months with the, the tendonitis. Um, got in the men's eight. We got sixth. Um, yeah. Like I mentioned, we had a, quite a few sixth places, um, which was the same as our result from Rio the year before. So, yeah. Yeah, you were so, held, held, held steady at that stage. We were, we were consistent. Yeah. 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 You get points for consistency. Um, so we, uh, yeah, we got six. We came back into this, into the, the our off season, the NZ summer. I had a good summer. Uh, was selected for the men's pair. Yeah. And um, this was one, this was two seasons after Hamish and Eric retired. Mm-hmm. Um, the, there were two guys that had done the pair the year before and the stroke sider, which was the side that I rode on out to the right hand side, he decided he'd had enough. So he was retiring. Um, and so there was an opening there, which who was that? Uh, it was Jamie Hunter. Jamie Hunter. Yeah, right. yeah. So Tom Murray was in the pair with, with Jamie Hunter, and Tom was one of the guys in my junior four, and also in the Rio eight. Um, and so I'd rode with him quite a bit, and, and we 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 did the pair in the uh, in the off season. Was he North Shore too? No, he was no. Not, he was Melbourne Boys. Right. Yeah, he's still on the team as well. He's he's had a very long rowing career, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and still going, obviously. Yeah. Um, but um, we jumped in the pair. It went quite well. We got selected for the pair for that season, which I was incredibly excited about. Mm-hmm. Um, and then um, again, three days after that selection was when I fell <laughs> off the roof. Three again. Yeah, I was, I was I was not enjoying the number three over those couple of years. Um, and I'd, I'd, so I was, I was I was just cleaning some gutters for my parents at their rental property. I I I, I can't sit still. That's yeah. just that's just me in general. I, I I've always got to have something going on and. Um, that was a, a bit of, you know, it didn't help me a lot in sport because you, you need to rest a lot when you're excited yeah. that much. But I was cleaning gutters and I was kind of, I, I had a ladder on the end of a pergola. That was how mm-hmm. I got up onto the roof and I was coming down the pergola and, and the nails that were holding the bit of timber that I was on at that, at that point in time, the nails just pulled out and I fell with, with the section of the pergola that I was on. Um, so I fell It about, fell under you there? It fell under Ooh. me and I, and I fell three metres and landed. Ooh, that's um, high enough, isn't yeah, it? <laughs> landed in a seated position on my wrist and and um, it was a college fracture, so that was just the, the whole tip of the radius had just basically splintered into bits. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I don't know how bad it was. I knew that it hurt a hell of a lot because by the time I got to the hospital with my mate driving... Um, Someone was there with you? Yeah, he was there with me. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, insult to injury, I landed in a recycling bin. Um, so I landed in a recycling bin with my hand on the ground. Yeah, it was, so I had a, had a cut ass and a broken wrist. Um, <laughs> so it, we got got to hospital. I was just soaked in sweat. It was it was the most nasty experience. It was the most pain I, I've ever experienced. Did you ambulance here or did he drove you? No, he drove me there. Yeah. Did you take anything? Not until I got to hospital. Holy heck! Yeah. So we, we drove Cambridge to Hamilton and. Oh my god. We. Did it faster than Google Maps. Yeah. Said that we were going to do it because my mate was looking at me going, holy heck. Um, anyway, we got there and, and I remember just being, because I was still, you know, I wanted to be in this pair, I remember being like, oh, you know. It'll be all right. Well, I'll be, is it just like, it's just dislocated today. Eh? I will put it back and I'll be, and I'll be back in, in, in two weeks. And they were like, nah. Do you remember what it looked like to it was, you? It was messy. Yeah. I, I didn't, I didn't compound. It didn't break skin, but. Yeah. Um, I, I, it was it was all out of shape because because I'd crushed I'd landed like that and, and crushed mm. the joint. My hand was kind of in in the wrist a wee bit. Mm-hmm. It had kind of sunk in it a couple of centimeters. Oh so, my god! And then it was out of shape and and the fingers because of the all of the muscles that come over the wrist into into the fingers had kind of just slipped through the joint and it was the fingers were all messy and and not opening properly and yeah and so did they put put you under first? Some surgery. They put me under for surgery. Yeah, yeah. They, they definitely did. But the first thing they did was they pulled the wrist out of the out of the joint, and so they gave me morphine, so I didn't feel a thing. And and I, one doctor was hooked around here, pulling. Were they able to block block you or not? Just morphine and go. They just morphine. I, I didn't feel any of it. Yeah. It was the that was it was it was obviously so it was no pain, but it was disgusting because because <laughs> there was one. Yeah, you know, they they got the two what looked like the two biggest male <laughs> nurses or doctors in, in, in the ward and um, one was hooked around my arm so I was like this I was sitting like this trying not to look at it and you've probably got bigger arms than most people uh, come and, with and they were bigger than they are now now that I'm retired but um, 
one was hooked around here and he was and he was just leaning back yeah and the other had two hands on my wrist that was bent like that and he was pulling it out oh my god and i just was sitting there like, oh i think there's there's you know there's at least 100 150 force <laughs> going through my broken wrist right now and it was oh it was i remember being so pale um, my mate took a video and I, was, I looked so pale but they pulled it out and then bent it down so that the hand couldn't go, go back, back and go back in and, and i stayed in the cast once it was at that point it was yeah it was, it was no rush and it wasn't life-threatening so i ended up staying in a cast for i think it was about three days before i got into surgery mm -hmm. um but the doc said you know, he's like you're not gonna row again he said, again. He said you're not gonna row again and you're not and you'll and you'll never be a pianist i think it's gonna be funny um Fuck, I, i've got a fucking puppy with some of the shit r r doctors say eh? yeah i had, I had a old lady come in today be like oh the doctor said if i don't get cataract surgery i'm not gonna be able to drive when, in two years and i was like well they shouldn't have said that because one you can and like i was like is there anything medical wrong with you because like if that's grounds then you can't drive but your right vision was. if your vision's fine your vision's fine like yeah. you can't say that like you're in your 80s you've been cataracts for yeah. years like fuck. yeah and that's the same sort of shit oh yeah yeah you can't you can't yeah. i'm not going to give you a chance right now <laughs> Dino. He, he said that obviously it was, it was gutting um <laughs> later i used i ended up buying a piano and self-teaching like, <laughs> man fuck that doctor i'm gonna i'll show him <laughs> he's got no idea but <laughs> i did it for me what do you uh, what do you play michael <laughs> nothing very well actually <laughs> Sounds like me with a guitar sitting next to Petty Devon. Oh, like, geez, he's diggity, good, diggity, diggity. Yeah. Oh, dude, yeah. dude, dude. <laughs> when no one's there, I feel like I play it well. But anyway, um, luckily it wasn't the case. Yeah, um, could, absolutely. Could, could get back to rowing, um, but it was it was a relatively serious break. Um, it was you know, unlike your, your typical um, break by name, break by nature. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's a bit of bit of foreshadowing there. Yeah. <laughs> um unlike a, your typical six week recovery for, for or six to eight week for a broken bone it was three months for that mm -hmm. one and um, so metal wear in there holding the holding the tip of the bone in the right place and um, have you still got it the metal wear yeah you have still got it somewhere yeah i'm not sure where it is no, and not in you not in me no, no you're not in me it was because you yeah, know the wrist is quite thin um on during winter it would the metal would get quite cold and mm -hmm. get quite a sore wrist so i got it out yeah, old man said it was, you know, Carapere is one of those places where the cold just gets into your bones and so it'd be even worse if you got a piece of metal it in there. Gets into the metal in your bones as well, yeah. <laughs> Can't confirm. Can't confirm <laughs> that. Oh, nice. So you went to the pier after that? Yeah, well, so so when I was in the hospital a couple of days after the break, my pier partner, Tom, and, and coach came in and they said, oh, we've talked to the docs and it's it's a bad break. We, you know, we've got to deselect you from the pier. Yeah. Like, oh, man. And that, that was my shot. Um, three days after. So was, was it just going back? Was that a new season? And they were like, Mike, you're going for the pair. Yeah. 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 I'd, I'd been officially selected for the pair with Tom. Yeah. Like it was, you're going to be competing at the World Champs. And that was because the Nationals, you'd done well in the pair? Uh, we, we had a good season. I think we were unbeaten at Brigadas that off season. Yeah. Uh, and then come trials, we. T together, you'd rode together. We rode together the yeah. off season, yeah. And we'd done quite well. Um, so it was, I mean, it was it was a promising off season, mm -hmm. um, and then yeah, the break happened. And three days after I broke my wrist, though, um, Tom, the guy I rode with, he broke three toes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so neither of you went. Well, so so they said, oh, you know, it's, it's only broken toes; it should take six weeks to re yeah. to recover. Um, you know, we're, we're not going to bring you guys back because Tom will still beat you back by six weeks. So. Um, so Tom trained for two weeks, and I, I think I, I, I took a, about ten days off and then started training as well. Mm -hmm. um, just legs, getting back on the bike, and um, he got some X-rays done at two weeks, and the doctor said, I don't, I don't know how they they do it, but he, they said it looks like you broke this yesterday, but your bones haven't healed at all. Mm. And so he goes, oh shit, um, and so the coach goes, oh bloody hell! He, at this point, he's pretty pissed off. Got he said, no rowers. He said, yeah, he said, "Well, you, you." Re he said, "Now we're mo now we're messing around." The other guy who's been recently who's been brought into the pier to, to fill my spot. So he said, "Oh, you two, you know, you two cripples, you're you're reselected for the pier together, and you'll train on the land for a couple of months, and 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 that's and that's the plan this season." And so we Tom was Tom couldn't use his feet, 
well, his foot. So, so he was on one of those assault bikes where you just yeah. just oh, peel him with the arms. And he was doing a couple hours a day on that. What? Yeah, he was doing he was doing a couple to. Geez, I can't even remember. He might have been even done th- a few hours, and he was doing a, a lot of weights as well, upper body weight. Okay, yeah, I've done a thousand calories on a what bike a couple of times, and it's not fun. No, nah. at all. No, nah. and that's with using the legs. Yeah, because <laughs> could he use his legs doing that or not really? Not really. Yeah, I mean, he could use one, but I think he was he just ended up just just resting them, just doing arms. Doing arms, fuck. It, it was uh, yeah. <laughs> He's, we'd sit up on the deck at Rowing NZ and at this point the assault bike wasn't a, a commonly used um, piece of machinery. Noisy, although it's no, ergs. Noi- noisy, but also for a rower who either ergs on the rowing machine or bikes, yeah. that movement looked real gumby. And I remember he was, he was <laughs> quite ash- I, th- I think he was quite ashamed about it, or at least put on a bit of a show acting to be ashamed. Because yeah. Yeah, people would look up and go, oh, what's he doing? You know, well, I knew what he was doing, but... but was the um, ski erg around then? Or well, I suppose there's a bit of pressure through your legs, but... Yeah, it was, but yeah, he couldn't get on his toes. Yeah. Because of the broken toes, he had to fully offload them. Um, yeah. Especially after he found out that he wasn't healing. He was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we were just this, this, this rehab pair for, for a couple of months. Um, and following the year before where I'd you know, worked out that you can actually get a, a benefit out of... Um, being out of the boat mm-hmm. um i thought well shit i'm going to push it a bit more this time and so we did we did some we did some stupid time on our on our um, machines that, like i was our, our training would go in, in in phases still so you'd have a lighter week and you'd build 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 and you come back and um you'd come back a little bit higher each each block so you, you were progressively building up and during the heavy week it was you know six hours on the bike a day wasn't uncommon for for six days a week and you mm. had a day off and it was just enough to get head above water and go again and do six more days um and yeah the the longest ride i did was was six and a half hours continuous did you distract yourself or you just bloody minded there's about only, the thing? there's only so many movies you can watch on yeah. the bike and then you just get bored and zone out we're like joe rogan and watching bloody um Keanu, Keanu Reeves kill a whole bunch of room of people over and over again John, John Wick wasn't it what he, what he watched over and I, over again I don't think the, the I think only the first John Wick was out at that point so, <laughs> and again there's only so many times you can watch John Wick in one yeah. day before you get to move on Pre, <laughs> uh, was Netflix starting to be a thing then I think it might have been might have still been DVDs at that eh? <laughs> <The> station <laughs> yeah my, um, my CD player didn't last that long yeah I, th- I went through a few headphones. I was going to say sweat, headphones were sweat. You, yeah, you drown them in sweat, and yeah, yeah, six and a half hours on the bike was the longest, and that was that was brutal. Yeah, you you get through some food on that as well. Yeah, back back to Eric and Hamish, like soaking the floor. Like, what does that even look like when there's eight or ten of you trying to bust out an hour erg? Like, is the place just damp rank rankness? <laughs> Yeah, it smells as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it smells of bo. It's I could the only thing I could liken it to really would be a swamp. <laughs> it's, it's disgusting. Yeah, we we one time we were training in Switzerland. This was uh, I think this was the Rio campaign. This was the twenty sixteen year, and we were. If any of the guys end up listening to this, um, they will recall this session vividly as well. And we were training in this place called Cersei in Switzerland and we had our, our rowing machine, our erg room upstairs and, and it was kind of like an attic of a rowing club mm-hmm. and yeah. the, the airflow was, was poor. It was a heat wave at the time, a European heat wave, so it was stinking hot um, and we had a, a brutal long session to do and God, it was so hard but when we got off the ergs and, and sat, or, and stood on the floor I should say, um, there was a little bit of a sag in the floor so it allowed it to pull quite nicely and it ended up being nearly ankle deep oh and you got God. out and you're thinking this is disgusting <laughs> that's why probably why it sags <laughs> <'Cause Yeah. laughs> that's it's just had that it's season all, all, after season after yeah. season <laughs> I mean, we, we got some wild stories about how much we sweat because um, Japan was hot yeah. um, for, for the Tokyo Olympics the, the 2017 world champs were hot um, and so we we would frequently do heat training mm. in hot areas and, and measure uh, our weight loss to work out how much we've sweated yeah to work out how much we've got to replace it with of like a race piece or a training piece training yeah so 
so we did, there was I mean another time and this was probably the most the most impressive stat I've got for, for sweat um, impressive or gross I don't know you're about to find out <laughs> and judge for yourself um, we were training in Italy again during a heat wave this was 2018 2019 um, and so it was it was stinking hot. I think we were training in around forty degrees, and um, we'd have to weigh ourselves before and after to just make sure we weren't losing too much to sweat. Yeah. Um, you get halfway through a row and, and water's sloshing around in the boat, and you go, "I've, you know, we haven't gone through a wave. It's been dead flat water, and my water bottle hasn't leaked. So the only thing that is is sweat, the sweat that's sloshing around, around in the bottom." Um, you know, not so bad for us, but for a coxswain who gets, you know, <laughs> who's sitting down and gets, you know, comes out of the boat with wet balls, you're going, oh, that's someone's sweat. Yeah. <laughs> it's not so nice. But um, uh, I ended up losing um, five and a half kgs over a two hour ride and drank two liters of water. So sweated out seven and a half kgs. Harley. Yeah. So what, what was the system for reordering? Just, Just drink as much drink as you can. Yeah. yeah. It was. We, we had the, we had the proper way that we meant to do it, um, and it was I think I think it was a, a liter an hour. Yeah. Um, you weren't meant to have more than a liter an hour, and you were meant to drink one point five times what you sweated out. Which I remember having some um, some heated discussions with with the nutritionists about how I was meant to get that in, and only heated. They were very reasonable. It was heated for me because yeah. I was severely dehydrated and angry about the Weren't situation. Straight. <laughs> and then how did you sleep? Well, you, you didn't wake up in the night. Then you go to the piss. You were that dehydrated. No, you, did, you didn't pee. Yeah. When you when you when we were sweating that much. Did you get any like dangerous levels, like going to the toilet and you know the old coke pee sort of level? Didn't didn't get to that, but got um so getting you know quite quite paranoid and get getting those you know some of the, the mental effects of dehydration did anybody ever over hydrate um not with any negative side effects yeah but yeah when you, you know, there was there was times where you go to the loo every five minutes because you drank so much water yeah but um no nah, we never had any any serious effects from over over hydration yeah, yeah. well that's good i suppose <laughs> yeah what happens with that uh, you can die <laughs> from from overhydration. Overhydrating, it's like, so, it's like drowning or something. Yeah, it? sort of. It's a problem in marathons where they have too many drink drink stops, and I don't think it's too bad with the elite level stuff, but like the people that do in sort of four hours and stuff, they stop at each drink station, and they have a like big drink of water. They can yeah dilute their um, electrolytes and yeah can kill them. Holy heck. Yeah, I think it gives you a heart attack. Sure, I didn't realize that was a thing. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to put this glass of water down. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, like I say, it'd, it'd be over a good period of time and you've just over, overcooked it. Yeah. Yeah, I've had, had Tim Nix on the podcast and it was like one of the big things he, he sort of found in the 90s, I think it was, that it's like one of his big, big claims before he was sort of demonized for low carb stuff. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. No, he's, it's an interesting. He's found a lot of interesting things about nutrition and sport but now he's obviously hotly debated <laughs> yeah it doesn't, doesn't take much these days yeah. Yeah. <laughs> on the flip side of all the nally stuff did, did you sort of have some fun fun moments like um you're a competitive but beers was talking about a pub in lucerne that they i think they picked the up a swan we, the one we hear it got the swan yeah, <laughs> yeah. What was that? there was pickwicks in lucerne that we used to go to. they still go there yeah um Oh, we, we had plenty of fun. Yeah, yeah, we, we, we had plenty of fun. Like there was uh, one time in Lucerne as well that we we were young. We were shoot, was it? it might have was it the Rio, Rio campaign? No, I think it was the year before Rio. It was twenty twenty fifteen, mm-hmm. and we had an average age in our, in our crew of I think twenty one. <laughs> yeah, it, was, it was a young crew, and um, we got to nine pm on a Saturday night, so we'd have Sundays off. We got to nine pm and and we thought, oh, we're bored. What should we do? And the logical thing would be go to bloody go sleep. To bed, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're, you're you're paid athletes on tour and you've got a rest day for a reason. But oh, you know, twenty. I was twenty at the time. Oh, we're bored. What should we do? Oh, we'll catch a train until Lucerne, which is fifteen minutes away. So we went in and, and we and we we didn't we didn't go crazy. We had, we had a couple. All of good beers. stories out of the All Black start with, with we, we caught a train. We caught a train, yeah. <laughs> and we had a couple of beers and there was a there was an art festival on and and, and we ended up smooth talking our way into this art festival because you know we, we did. Um, and then we we got to 
oh, I can't remember what time it was, but um, it wasn't super late. We thought, oh, shoot, we better head, we better head back. Um, and um, the last train we got, fuck. And we're like, oh, shit. <laughs> so we... Um, High box? So, so well, what do, you, like, what do we do? We're like, oh, we better go, go to that nightclub over there and work out what our plan is. <laughs> so we, we ended up going to, to this, this nightclub and we actually, we had a, it was, we were still miles out from, from Pinnacle again, like, I'm talking six, seven weeks out. And we ended up having a bloody good night. We didn't catch any swans. Um, <laughs> Bring them in the club. <laughs> yeah, we, we we had a good time um, as you know, young guys travelling, and and we ended up all sleeping in the train station at yeah. about. I got a photo somewhere, um, <laughs> but we got kind of like sleep. We're all sleeping on one park bench, kind of piled on each other, waiting for the the five a.m. train to start up. Um, <laughs> we almost and we almost got away with it. Except yeah. when we um, when we were coming back up from the train station to our accommodation, the team manager was heading out at six to return a rental van on Sunday morning, and busted us. Um, and so we um, we got in a lot of a lot of crap for that. Yeah. And we we were, were given some particularly hard sessions because of what we'd done. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I think that was actually what led to the sweaty erg room story. <laughs> <laughs> so like, um, you go to Plovdiv, you know, yeah, what? Still at high school? Yeah, it was last year at yeah. high school, 2012, yeah. And you win? Yeah. Do you think you l- learned anything out of that? And then how does that compare to getting to go to the, your first Olympics, Rio de Janeiro? The water's a bit uh, questionable. But <laughs> <laughs> and you guys, as you say, finished last in the A final. But Learn anything from juniors. I learned, well, you learn everything. You, le- you learn a lot from anything, right? If yeah. You, if you're looking... looking if you, or if you reflect on it, I guess. But um, juniors was just, well, it was my first time stepping up from, from school level to, to New Zealand rep. Um, and I, I, they, they push you hard, but it, it's not it's not ridiculous. You know, you're still kids and they're, and they're aware of that. But um, it was my first time going to Europe. Yeah. So so kind of you know, mind-blowing seeing all the history over there compared to compared to home <laughs> um you know we're, we're a few hundred years old our country whereas yeah. they're you know they're 1500 years old they've rebuilt after a couple of wars too yeah yeah so uh, totally mind-blowing going over there um learned quite a lot about bringing together a a team that has been selected because of individual mm-hmm. ability um, somewhat um, obviously there's an element of how well we gelled together that came into selection but um, what were your events at high school? Uh, I did the the four and the eight for mm-hmm. so the, yeah, the sweeping events and um, our stroke seat Tom Jenkins he he did the pair and he was he was he was a, a legend of um, our um, our year group at school he, he was just an absolute weapon in that boat um so he, yeah, he was he was in the pair, and then we had Tom Murray, who I was talking about earlier, who did the pair with. Um, he he won the four, so they beat us in the four. Uh, he did the eight as well. Can't remember where they finished. Um, and then the other guy with the coxswain was Sam Bosworth. So he mm-hmm. ended up. You know, we we had quite quite different rowing careers. Um, Sam coxed the women's eight for for quite a while, mm. um, and then ended up we ended up back in the same boat with Tom Murray for the Tokyo Olympics. Uh, mm-hmm. And then the last guy was Cam Webster. Yeah. Um, who was one of my best mates from school so we actually rode through Westlake together we were sitting next to each other and you did quite way. a lot together with North Shore too eh? we've had heaps together yeah. Yeah. yeah we've done heaps we've we've had heaps of national we've been lucky enough to win heaps of national titles together and we've shared a lot of our, our rowing journey together and um, we've only recently kind of split paths he's gone on to Emirates Team New Zealand yeah. as a psych four um, <laughs> which is awesome um, um yeah, we, we've shared a lot together. It's been it's been really cool. But um, yeah, coming back to to the the juniors though, um, bringing together all of those those different backgrounds. Um, well, that was my first time doing that because for the school rowing, it was like we're we're all from the same school, so we we and we all want to row, so we row together. Whereas this time round, it was people were kind of hand picked, and and how do we bring this together? And for school rowing, we had four years mm. until our until our final pinnacle event whereas for juniors we had um about six weeks i think of, mm. of, of training back after trials training on our own 
and then we had a I think it was an eight week training block and then we went to the world champs so it wasn't massive yeah um, but it was intense um, how, how did you sort of figure out how to push each other was that all part of it like how hard we can all work I think I think at that age it was we, we had a we we had a lot of guidance from our coaches still. Yeah. There was still a lot a lot of hand holding. Yeah. Um and yeah, very very firm guidance, which at that age I think it was necessary. Yeah. Um in part because um I, I won't speak for the others, but I definitely didn't know what the standard was or, or, or where where it could be or where I could take myself. And was that also the first time you were introduced to like world standard times and like yeah, pro- prognostic absolutely yeah. rowing <laughs> yeah yeah first time first time to progs um yeah and can you explain prognostics to people that might not understand what you guys do out on the course yeah so so prognostics we um every boat class in rowing it goes at a different speed hmm. um and so if, if i I'll, I'll use for this example a a woman's single and a, a men's eight which are typically at relatively opposite ends of, of the speed spectrum um you can still compare a woman's single performance against a men's eight performance, um, obviously just not by speed. Mm. But what you can take is you can take the um, the percentage of the world record speed. So say um, a men's eight, for example, these, these numbers aren't, aren't accurate, but say a men's eight, to get a world record, the, the speed is 10 meters per second average mm. across a, a, a piece, a 2K piece. Um, Say you go out and do an, a, a piece, it can be any length, and, and you average 9 metres per second. Well, then, if your world's best was 10, then you got a 90% prognostic. Mm. Um, and so, with that way, so a, a woman's single, it's, again, it, it might be, um, for the, you know, the, the um, point of, of explaining this, that might be uh, 5 metres per second for a world record. It's probably a lot faster than that. Um, and they might, and, you know, Emma for example, might go out and, and do 4.9, in which case she's got like a, a 98% prognostic. Mm. And so you can compare that percentage to um, see how you did. Because mm. um, going off times is, is not always that accurate because you've got varying conditions. You might have current, you might have wind, you might have a longer distance as opposed to, you know, or, or, you, know you might do a 10K piece. Mm. And so you can't just go off times. So... What you can do is you can use your prognostics to benchmark against other crews, um, and that was that came into play. Well, we used that our, our whole throughout the whole New Zealand rowing journey, but we used it a lot. We leaned into it a lot um, for the Tokyo campaign mm-hmm. because we had four gold medal crews, so we had a lot of consistent high achievers around us mm. that we could chase down. Um, and we didn't have any international competition, so we needed to find something to chase. And, mm. and, and we had some of the best in the world um, rowing alongside us, but because we were a, a, a men's eight, which is, which is on you know, by speed, it's one of the fast boats, um, we needed to use those percentages, and we did. And, it, and geez, it was uh, without it, I don't think we would have done anywhere near as well as we did. How did that differ from Rio? Um, Rio, uh, we we were a bit green in Rio. We I think we we lacked, we didn't have the same level of maturity that we had in in Tokyo. Yeah. Um, none of us had, bar our coach, had been to the Olympics, so it was also, <laughs> the Olympics are something else. It's like going to the circus. There's, yeah. It's you you you've got media in your face everywhere. You've got, um. You know, at least for rowing where there's typically uh, world champs is not very fancy there's there's so much going on around you um, there's you know Usain Bolt's walking into yeah. the food hall you've got um, you know Nadal walking around you've got like, all, all of these basketballers and, NBA uh, basketballers yeah all the, all the basketballers um, there's 20,000 of the of you know a good chunk of the world's best athletes mm. um you know, there's for Rio, there's free McDonald's, which you you're not taking, you're not having until after the you're racing. But you get, you get a free phone, you get all of this. You know, there's just, it's just there's just so much distraction is what I'm getting at. Mm. Um, and no matter how much you get told about it, I think for your first Olympics, you you'll always get caught off guard by by how intense that is. Um, 
and I said, so, so we got we got caught off a bit by that. But we our lead in was also not very not very good. We didn't have a very good lead in. We um, our wheels fell off a wee bit. Um, I think we, we I, th- I I think we, we stopped having fun mm-hmm. um, that year before. You know, like I said, we, we went into Lucerne and we you know, got a little bit silly. Um, but in hindsight, probably at the right time. You know, it was in the middle of a hard training block. It it probably wasn't it, w- it wasn't the best thing for physical performance, but for actual crew bonding and mm. and not not being too serious it was probably actually just right for a bunch of 20 21 year olds <laughs> um but then for the olympic year because it was the olympics we said oh well, we, you know we're not doing any of that this year yeah and we didn't and, and I, I think we were just a bit too tense stiff to yourselves yeah yeah you were obviously in the, in the pier what was it like the guys saying about mahi and bondi coming into the eight like um and the Danny o'connor doco kind of talked about it like being the savior and then sean we mentioned him before his speech, he kind of talks about being stuck in the middle between... Sean was literally in between Hamish yeah. and, and Maha, yeah. Having a fight about, like, Bondi calling Mahi fat and Mahi, Mahi saying you don't know how to move a boat. Yeah. <laughs> they never lost a, a race in the pier. Um, <laughs> don't know how to move a boat. Yeah. <laughs> and he's a rower. And yeah. Mahi's a scholar. <laughs> um, it, was, it, was, it was cool. It was cool having those guys commit to the act. Like, yeah, I like, don't get me wrong. That I, I don't reckon that the eight in Tokyo. I I don't know if it would have happened if they had. That would have been like the genesis of taking it forward, right? I I think it, it definitely contributed. Yeah. Um. At the end of the day, Bondi was the spark for the Tokyo eight that that, that breathed breathed that life back into it. In, in my opinion. Um. But Mahe and, and and Hamish coming back was was it was it was awesome to see. Yeah. Um. I don't think it had the quite had the desired effect and, and, and didn't quite go how everyone expected. Um I don't know why. I wasn't I wasn't close enough to, to them yeah. um to know to know why that is. Um I mean at, at least for the history books it's cool seeing Mahe and Hamish <laughs> in a in an eight together. That's that's pretty sweet. Yeah. Um Yeah, I, yeah, I mean the, the closest I got to those guys during that was um we Sean Mahe, Stephen Jones, Brooke Robertson and I we those those guys were all in the eight while I was in the pier. Um, we shared an Airbnb for for six weeks nice. while, while we were in the training camp. So I um, kind of heard how things were going for those guys, but <laughs> um, I was pretty focused on the pier and, and not dehydrating at that point. It yeah. was one of those heat waves. <laughs> so here's a rumor, Michael. You can say as much or as little as you want about this one. Did because uh, you qualified the pier? Yeah. Did yeah. did Bondi threaten to seat race you out? If he didn't join the eight, he did. He did do that. <laughs> yeah, no, it was. I think it was. It was. It was good taste blackmail. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't. I. I heard a rumor that he was. That he was bluffing. Um, <laughs> in the moment, I didn't want to take that risk, though. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. He. He did say that. He. Because um, Bondi had, had gone off and he was doing his Commonwealth Games cycling and, and, and obviously doing bloody well at that, but with his cycling, he'd lost a lot of his upper body strength. Yeah. Um, and then he, so he came back and he, he was he was as fit as anything, but he it took him a while to build back the arms that he needed for rowing. Um, and so the first year that he was building back, um, Tom and I managed to to hold off any attempts that he had to to beat us mm-hmm. and, and race him um still a, a absolute weapon in training like he was still beating us a boy bit in training in that season but when it came to racing we'd, we'd get him um and we, and we got him and we and we held our spot but then covid came around and we didn't and we didn't race and <laughs> he had another year and a half to or year another year to get to get, get ready in. and and um he did uh and then that season during the pandemic he he would consistently beat me by about four seconds in a pair to the point where it, it knocked my co- it knocked my confidence um, <laughs> enough that um, I thought shit I, I probably fancy myself in, in second place behind him for stroke side mm-hmm. um, and then he did come to me and said oh if you go for the pair I'll go for the pair if, but if you go for the eight I'll go for the eight and I was like oh fuck <laughs> I remember saying man can you just fuck off <laughs> so how, how, would, how did he go to like was Tony there yet? Tony was there yep yeah yeah um yeah uh, uh, 
I, I or like the selectors start talking to you like Michael what are you going to do this season like we know you've qualified the boat he came to me quite early um, Bondi did he came to me, he came to yeah. me quite early it was quite a bit before trials <laughs> um, and he said oh you know have a bit of a think about it I remember we, we went out for dinner one night and he said that like, bastard <laughs> um, <laughs> but it, oh, I had a hunch he might be bluffing but it wasn't you know the, the I, I, at that point, I was pretty confident. I, I, I was a bit burnt out from it all with the pandemic and Ergie, mm. and I was sick of injuries and cross training. And and, um, and I mean, I, I called I called heaps of people for advice on it because um, yeah, I mean, I, I spoke to Mike Stanley about it. Mm-hmm. He he stroked the eighty two eighty three eight, um, and so and he's been a mentor my whole rowing career. Pretty sure I had Mike stay at my house a couple of times. <laughs> Back in the day when small, I was little. Small country. Hey? <laughs> we had Rob Woodhouse stay at our house too. <laughs> it was random. <laughs> <laughs> Did he eat all your food? Oh, fuck. Just a little tangent. Um, I was in Taumuru and, and Sonia and their daughter came in and I retold the story to Sonia. I was like, I remember sitting there just watching him eat these massive like bowls of muesli. He'd like pour one, yeah. finish it. Poor another for <laughs> shit. Then he went like we went out and trained. Then he came back, did the same thing again. I was just like, this is unreal. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's just like yeah, it sounds about right. <laughs> Rob and his athlete days. I mean, even now he's talking about. He was a big, impressive. Oh yeah, the ducking human. ducking into the door thing was pretty unreal. Like, oh, yeah, I'm eight, and I was like Jesus. <laughs> yeah, he's one of those guys. Him and um and Patty and um. Yeah, they're, they're two guys every time. I, and George Bridgewater, I know yeah, George. Yeah. Those three guys, every time I see them, I've seen them countless times, every time I see them again, I'm like, Jesus, you are tall. Yeah. Yeah. Were you at New Zealand Rowing when James Dallander pulled himself off the erg, broke the handle? No. Yeah, they must no, have been. I, I, oh, no, because that was in the four. Yeah. I, I, yeah, no, I wasn't around when he did that. Yeah, Joey, I, I, did, I did confirm it with Dallander. I, yeah. I'd, I'd heard that he went through the wall and carried on, but no, he, he said, I flew off the erg, broke the handle. <laughs> Jeez, he did that. Yeah. Oh, jeez. Well, he's got that farm strength, doesn't yeah, he? Farm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, jeez, where were we? <laughs> we're, talking, we're talking about body threatening to, to take out, um, but, and then and then how, how you actually ended up trialling in the eight. <laughs> right, yeah. Um, so, I mean, yeah, so I spoke to Mike, um, and he, he gave me some good advice, and... I spoke to Barry Mavitt as well. He was um, he'd been he'd been a coach at North Shore and Westlake, and um, you know I asked him for some advice on that, and, and he agreed with Mike um, and talked to a few others. And the um, asked the audience came back with a pretty unanimous go for the eight. Mm-hmm. Um, and then to not qualify, what did they feel like? <laughs> well, yeah, because I mean, context right? We'd, we'd qualified the pair, and the eight wasn't qualified. Yeah. Um, because yeah, you know, the eight, the eight missed out narrowly, and um, it sounds worse than it was. The eight, the eight, just missed out on qualifying. It was another those beep beep moments. Exactly, they, they just missed out on qualifying. But on top of that, they were, they were only four seconds off first anyway. Mm. So from first to sixth, where they got um, to not qualify, um, they were still only four seconds off first place. So the eight. Yeah, it wasn't actually. It wasn't Did you not run that race? No, I was in the, oh. I was in the pair. Oh, that was the same as the pair, yeah, right? Yeah. So that was the year that we got second in the pair and qualified that. Um, the boys, you know, still went bloody fast. Um, that was with Hamish and, and Mahe that one, but but missed out by, you know, point one or point two of a second or something on qualifying the eight. Yeah. Um, and so so fast forward it a year um, through the pandemic. Um, yeah, I didn't fancy taking on Hamish and didn't fancy seeing whether he was bluffing. Um, and on top of that, the eight was actually was the eight was going quite well at that point. We'd we'd done a bit of training in it and it was and it was going pretty handy. Um, and and also Tom and I weren't making the pair click as well as we had in the past for for a reason that at that point we couldn't work out. It was mm-hmm. it was frustrating us. Um, so the eight seemed like a good option, um, all things considered. Yeah. Um, so yep, said. I, I put it out there that I wasn't going to be going for the pair. Um, Bondi also said the same at, at that point, which might have been the plan. The, the, yeah, I would have felt like a real dick if he had then said he was going for the pair after I said I was going for the eight. <laughs> um, which then um, I think in in turn um, Tom also decided that that he'd he'd go for the eight. Um, 
So at that point, um, yeah, and the, and the other guys that were in the eight previously were, were all keen on that as well. And, and so at that point, it was it was again you know, relatively unanimous that we'd that we'd try and for the first time since I don't you know, I don't know when maybe back in the eighties we we were prioritising the eight yeah. for for men's sweep because it had been the pair for so long. Yeah. Um, probably the four about 15 years ago but yeah we're prioritizing the eight again um so yeah there we were and then they send you on a uh a mission with no guarantees of coming home (laughs) yeah yeah well so so you're right yes the eight wasn't qualified so in the middle of the pandemic we had to go to to switzerland to qualify so you were like one of the first people to leave the country and some of the first people to come back in right yeah, we, we, we were, yeah, we, I mean, we... Some of the first people to get vaccinated. <laughs> we did jump the queue, yeah, we we got, this is, oh, this is a bit controversial, I guess, but um, we kept it very quiet at the time. We got vaccinated um, at the same time as the people that were, you know, yeah, at risk. Um, people with, like... Um, Had doctors started? We were, I think we were around the start yeah, of the I think doctors, I, I yeah. sort of got one around February-ish, maybe March. Yeah, yeah, and, and then we get out. Yeah. We, 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 my, my, my first one because I was in Hawke's Bay. It was pretty much like all doctors in the the later end of the doctors were starting to get it, and then my second one, all the um, being Hawke's Bay, all the people that were fruit picking and elderly had started to get it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> so you were before all them. All, yeah. I remember we would jump in the queue quite quite badly, and someone was saying, "Don't tell anyone because it." <laughs> It looks quite bad, but you've just been given special you special know, treatment, special treatment to get over and qualify your boat. Yeah, um, so, I mean we were very lucky in that regard. Um, very lucky that that we were given that because I mean without that we probably couldn't have gone. So yeah. um, anyway, we we got sat down. We, we were sat down. I think it was a few weeks out from needing to depart. Um, and rowing New Zealand, they weren't going to send anyone to this regatta. Mm. Um, and this was even before the pandemic. They decided, they'd, they'd said, if you don't qualify the boat at the Champs, you, we're not going to send anyone to last chance. Mm-hmm. Um, and the logic behind it was sound. It was that if you if you can't qualify a boat in the first round, you're probably not in medal contention and we're going for medals. So why would we take a crew? Medals create funding too, right? Correct, yep. yeah. So why would we take a crew that, that struggles to qualify when we're trying to get medals? Um, does New Zealand rowing have to pay for the Olympics or is that Olympics pays for what New Zealand Olympics pays for I'm not sure about the Olympics as far as the athlete funding goes I believe that once you reach a certain point or at least it might, I think it may have changed recently there's, there's quite a bit going on at the moment yeah. in that space but when I was there it was if you reach if you pass a certain performance standard at a pinnacle event then the following year you um, were high performance sport mm. funded um, but below that, it was New Zealand rowing funded, which typically came from sponsors, I believe, and mm. um, and the uh, funding that they get from high performance sport. Mm. Um, yeah, but um, shoot, where were we? Um, trying to go, trying to go. We were, we were trying to go to Switzerland. Um, they sat us down in a room and said, "This is before. This is when they decided." Oh no, sorry, further back. Um, they weren't going to send a crew to that brigada um and then one of the sponsors uh, sean colgan um stepped up and and i think he simon peterson was the ceo at the time and, and sean gave simon a um a check um a, a blank check and or a 100k check or something so it was just something that was easily going to cover mm. the campaign and um simon was going to try and convince the board to send the eight um and sean gave him that so he said if you know, one of the first questions the board will ask is, where's the money going to come from? And he said, if they ask that question, here's your answer. Yeah. Um, so we owe a lot to, to Sean um, and and um, BB, his, his wife, and, and Colgan Foundation for backing us on that. <laughs> Far out. Um, it's quite a power play, isn't it? Yeah. But it worked, um, and we, we got over... Um, sorry, we, we ended up in this meeting that we were just talking about, and they said, oh, you know, everyone here has a chance, and a chance... To, to say I oh, I'm not comfortable with going over yeah because at that point the pandemic was it was raging overseas and I think New Zealand was COVID free yeah but um, there was a lot of unknowns and a lot of fear at that point um, and so it was you know if you don't want to go say and there was and there was a couple of tour managers that had family and stuff that, mm. that opted against which was totally fair but 
all of the athletes said that they would go if they you know if they were in the crew or, or, or reserves um which was amazing because part of that trip was a it was getting over there um but b it was if uh Ronan Z said to us well if you if you get covid we actually don't know how we're gonna get you back <laughs> so so they, they're like well, was at that stage like basically if you tested positive you couldn't get on a plane eh? yeah yeah yep and i don't know where you where they'd put you as well and yeah it was <laughs> It was, we'll support you however best we can. We'll figure it out. <laughs> it would be, if you get COVID, we're just going to have to figure it out. And so they're like, holy heck, yeah. Um, but everyone signed up for it, and, and fortunately no one got COVID. Because um, that would have completely derailed the, the yeah. whole campaign. Um, so we got through, we, we qualified, and we qualified quite well against a crew that had previously raced... Um, I, think, I think the Europeans were still racing through the pandemic. Right. Um, the crew that we beat to qualify had be, been quite close to the the Germans who were leading nice. the field, and so we thought, "Geez, we're actually we're actually quite close." Yeah. Um, but that was the only racing we got before the Olympics. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So then, yeah, we we did that, and then we jumped on a plane and came back and spent two. Drove weeks everyone in MIQ crazy. Two weeks in MIQ and pissed everyone off because of how much we were demanding <laughs> the sports team that's just had priority vaccinations now demanding <laughs> from MIQ it was, what, what, what was feeding like did you the food, the food was great did they like smuggle you in supplements um, and stuff or um, we we carried a bit a bit with us yeah so we, we took a bit overseas and, and brought a bit back with us um, we had so that it was, you could you could receive deliveries they weren't um, the only thing they restricted was how much alcohol you bought in the room. <laughs> yeah. Um, but for us, obviously, that didn't matter at that point. Yeah. Um, Did you go and allocate yours to someone else? <laughs> <laughs> it all went to Tony. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it wasn't cups he of tea had, he, he was drinking. He was, he was drinking all the booze. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, yeah, we, um, <laughs> we, we didn't have the booze. Yeah. We didn't need the booze. Um, so, but we had um, we had quite a bit of support. Um, we had quite a few few um, generous people down in, in Christchurch. Um, um, Marcel, uh, one of the uh, sorry, I can't remember his last name, but he um, owned one of the pack and saves down there. Nice. He was he was quite generous, and and there was someone else. Um, we 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 had we had some very generous support while we were in there, and um, people sending in supplements and care packages as well so it wasn't just practical it was you know support and yeah making us feel good about what we're doing and um we had extra portions from miq as well so yeah it was it was it was we, we were we were quite well looked after the yeah. only thing that that I w- it would have been uh, nicer would have been um we were expecting to have two pieces of training equipment Mm-hmm. Um, because doing one movement and particularly the rowing movement is, is quite brutal to achieve the volume that we want to mm-hmm. um, and actually complementing the rowing movement with some, some bike work um, is, is quite beneficial especially if you're stuck as on the land as you've proven twice <laughs> as I've worked out yeah <laughs> <laughs> um, so we were expecting to have a bike and an erg but um, uh, there was just a, a blanket rule which it, it, it does make sense um have it have that blanket rule the blanket rule was one piece of machinery per room for fire hazard yeah so that you're not filling up the room with um with stuff but and, and the sweater probably set off the fire alarms <laughs> <laughs> yeah well we had um we had balconies which, yeah. was, which was lucky nice um yeah so um <coughs> so what did you do in, in terms of recovery did you have like normal boots or uh no we, we, we didn't unfortunately um just we, turn the chair on cold yeah, sit in the bath yeah sit in the bath <laughs> Put some bath salts in. Yeah. Light a candle. <laughs> yeah, you got nothing else to do. Yeah. Oh, we we um you, we were allowed out to walk. Yeah. Um, for, when you're stuck in a hotel room, you, we, we were training a lot. We were doing about two and a half hours a day on average on the rowing machine. Fuck. Yeah, it sucked. Um, but I mean, with all the downtime, we were people studying, but you just stretch and. Yeah. You know, I think some guys might have taken golf clubs in and practiced their swing. And <laughs> but it, it, we actually we we did we did we, I think we it was a combination of luck and and the fact that we had some pretty strong protocols in place to mm. to stay injury free because of how unsupported we were compared to being in a normal high performance mm. environment. Um, 
and in that isolation and his isolation with no physio no no massage no docs no mm. you know no um variety of training just yeah. just one you know, yeah one injury would stop your training and then what are you gonna do you can't do anything so then how does that contrast what six weeks later to to being in tokyo like sean talks about like Coming, again, and you two it says well for you like distraction like yeah what, what like <laughs> completely different was was the whole village isolated there yeah, it was meant to be sort of <laughs> it, was, it was meant to be um but at the same time they had to feed 10,000 athletes at yeah. once so it was leaky it was, it was there was gaps yeah you know, but I don't know how they would have got around it they, yeah. could, they couldn't have delivered that many meals you know and got did they test people while they were there yeah it was daily testing Fuck. daily PCR testing for everyone oh Jesus yeah, it was a saliva testing, so it was, yeah. yeah, it was it was pretty accurate. It was spinning all the time. It was spinning all the time, which was hard when you're dehydrated <laughs> in, in Japan in, in summer. Um, but yeah, the the, distra- the distractions. We, I mean, we had Hamish. Hey, this was his oh, fourth. Had, it was his fourth Olympics. Yeah. Um, for Tom, Sean, and I, it was our. I hope I'm not missing anyone. I think for Tom, Sean, and I, it was our. He's in the front four there first. Okay. The front four is, the or no? They, they, weren't, they, yeah, were, they, they didn't end up being so the front four, didn't they? Yeah. What, Matt, Tom, Phil, Dan. Yeah. yeah so we yeah. four. Uh, so the four, the four, four of the rowers plus Sam was their, their first Olympics. Mm-hmm. Um, and we, because uh, we, we, we kind of, uh, I think we we were quite quite focused. We we were a bit more mature than our, our Rio crew was at, at the time of Rio. Mm-hmm. Um. We were a bit more focused, but I mean, we also we we decided oh we're like it is also the Olympics, mm. you know, so we decided the first day you are allowed to soak it in as much as you want. You can mm. rub a neck and you can have a look around. You can when we go out for a row, you can look out of the boat, which is a bit of a no-no in rowing. You can you can have a look and 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 you know walk around the village as well a wee bit. So we yeah. yeah, and and actually experience it. Yeah, but as soon as we're into the second day, if you get caught, you're in you're in shit. So it's it's. Yeah, we we fully focused again from day two, and, and it, I think it actually worked quite well. And so you just um, had to do four races at that regatta, eh? We did three. Heat, yeah. uh, heat, heat, re- rep, and final. And final, right? Yeah, and um, yeah, we actually we, we fucked up the heat, eh? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we we didn't have a very good race. We just got excited, um, over over excited. Was any part of the race good or no? Um. I mean, it was all it was all good. We weren't far off the pace. Yeah. Um, but it was it, we just weren't we weren't where we knew we could be, mm-hmm. um, and we we didn't row the way that we you know had had rowed for the last eight weeks leading you know, between MIQ and the Olympics, and it mm-hmm. was and that was disappointing um, that we hadn't executed. But it was also exciting mm-hmm. um, and kind of not what you'd expect coming off the water from having you're not qualifying for the final again so we're back in an unqualified position um and we thought that we were in a better position than that but um you'd think we would be quite down about it but mm-hmm. um it was actually we came off and everyone was actually quite excited because i think we'd, we'd all realized that we that we were quite far off executing what we knew we could yeah what well, you'd done one race in two years we do, well we've done exactly <laughs> We'd done the the um, qualification race, and then we'd come in and done this heat. Yeah. And also, we'd gone up against everyone that we're going to be racing for an Olympic medal. So it was like, you know, the excitement was we just we just got overexcited. Yeah. And and everyone knew that we hadn't done what we knew we should have done. You know, it'd be like um, I, I don't know the equivalent. Like, you know, it'd be like if you were a race car driver and you had to drive a certain line, and, and you just got excited and tried overtaking and when you, you should have driven, driven us. you know what I mean it's, yeah. it's, it was just the process that we knew we had to follow in our heads it was so clear but we had gotten excited and, and not done that yeah. and so we knew we hadn't done what we knew we had to do and what we knew we could do so because it was so I don't, does that make sense yeah um, and bec- so because it was so clear cut mm-hmm. that we hadn't done what I was like oh well we're just going to go and do what we, need, what we need to do exactly it was yeah. just we just have to go and do what we what we know we have to do. Yeah, I've had a f- few rugby games like that. <laughs> <laughs> One in particular comes to mind, playing against Lincoln down in Christchurch. 
they creamed us and then they played them in the final I was like well I know what I had to do and you creamed them yeah and, well, and you got, yeah, we, you got we beat them yeah. <laughs> yeah but yeah no it's interesting like that well, it's, it's the crazy thing about you know sport is you can get caught up in the moment and yeah and the whole race or the whole game can go by and you just can't flip the switch but yeah. then you go off you have a breathe and you come back and play again and, and you can and you can correct it yeah no it's interesting eh mm. so um, I was in the roast hut in Te Aumuru with my phone uh, leaning up against the window banging on the steel steel benches then I drove up to, I was messaging dad and my brothers being like this is shit hot drove up to Auckland then went to the cloud I was picking up Paddy to go to the cloud yeah yeah okay. and so he'd been at the cloud I was talking to Kevin I can't think of his last name Burgess yeah Kevin Burgess yeah and then Paddy walks past me and he's kind of like oh Ryan how you going <laughs> at the cloud at the cloud can, it, oh, do you reckon you could take me home? Like, mate, that's why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that Tony um, O'Connor documentary? Is that the cloud that that video footage is from, or is that from inside? That, that's the cloud. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. I think I can see Kim Burgess' arm up video again as well. Yeah. Yeah. Because, oh, um, <laughs> yeah. Well, cause Emma, within that hour, right, Emma won. Yeah. The, the woman's eight got, got uh, a very close silver. Yeah. Um, and then we won. Yeah. But Emma was kind of expected because she'd just been so dominant for the whole season yeah um, well the whole Olympic cycle really and then um, and throughout the regatta she just every race she's just links in front um, and the women's eight did well but I think because they'd won in 2019 you know there was there was well there was definitely a hope that they'd, they'd be able to pull off a win yeah I just uh, so was, just so missed was, that race I was real gutted yeah. So, so, so their race, I think the reaction was a bit like, ooh, but then um, no one expected us to win. <laughs> <laughs> it was awesome. I, don't, I, mean, I think, I don't even know how many of us expect, none of us, I don't think any of us expected to win. We, Every we, time I watch that 1,000 metres, I'm just like, where the, what the fuck is going on there? Yeah. And then I think the um, commentators, because they're palms, called it, oh, Britain's doing a move. And they're like doing a move, like moving up on Germany, and you guys are moving further. <laughs> it's just like, they're going real fast, and you guys are going even faster. So even the commentators watching the race didn't expect it. <laughs> <laughs> they're like, here comes Great Britain, and you guys are moving out further. Like, well, what about that one? <laughs> Um, yeah, I, it was obviously it was very cool being there, and I wouldn't and I wouldn't change that. But the cloud was a very close second on that day. It looked like, it looked like a lot of fun. Yeah, that yeah. was that was still um, yeah. I probably got there about eight o'clock or something, and that was that was still pretty euphoric. And they were, I think they were starting to break up the um, champagne in the middle of the day. Was starting to take right. effect. It was, it was one o'clock in, in New Zealand that we raised. Wasn't yeah. It? It was, yeah, 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 cheapest. Um, <laughs> I heard that a 10 grand bar tab went down quite quickly. As, or it was put up as once we crossed the line, and I heard it was gone quite quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah it got spent on champagne. Yeah, very quickly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no. So then, then, like you said, that it's a chance to enjoy the village? Not even that. Well, we start so um, again, because of COVID, the. Oh. Um, everyone got shipped out quite quickly oh real so um there was there's quite a big group i think it was quite a, quite a decent chunk of the new zealand team that competed in the first week so it was as rowers um there was triathletes um surfers were with us as well uh swimming mm. uh rugby sevens men and women um and also quite good results in, in that group um obviously um and so we all got sent back the day after the rugby, so two days after rowing. Yeah. And that was where Did that, you get to go watch? No, we, well, we watched from home. Well, watched from the village. Yeah. There was no spectators, eh? Was, um, Fuck. Yeah. Yeah, obviously... Empty stands at rowing, empty stadium for rugby. With, with, Mika- with Michaela, obviously, you'd be quite close to her, but I still can't, like, watch them do the, the haka after them winning. It, like, brings me tears. Like, <laughs> like their story's similar to the eight, like, Rio being so close and like following it along and you know um, I played rugby sevens and so I you know, followed it for eight years and then to see what they did which was like awesome and like I remember Ruby um, we came up here uh, in 2014 and her like grabbing the mic and commentating a women's final game at, at yeah. Mount Sevens yeah. and then said yeah just to like know her a little bit as a character and then and then follow the journey and mm. it's just like oh yeah, <laughs> oh, that, that team's amazing, isn't it? Oh yeah, 
what they've done and how how they've done it is yeah and then it's the cool. same like two years later with the 15th <laughs> we just like fire up. this is awesome <laughs> yeah yeah they're on fire aren't they yeah, yeah. um yeah it's gonna be pretty cool getting to watch <laughs> this time yeah well you know I've, I've retired and the cable's still going so yeah i get to experience life on the other side now <laughs> so far it's been great yeah so far it's been brilliant yeah i've watched a couple of the i've been over and watched her a couple of times live now and it's, yeah it's good fun it's um party atmosphere obvi- obviously different to being an athlete but, <laughs> but um you haven't i'm quite happy with it you haven't poked your head in the outer grounds and thought oh i could do a bit of that and you know no. <laughs> quite happy in the stands with my beer in hand yeah at the moment. well they've got their beer in hand after they've finished playing that's true, true yeah so michael there's um not not to pick on erica mahi but there's uh, a couple of body shapes post rowing erica mahi and then there's uh hamish and and uh, nathan cohen and and joseph sullivan top top vibes yeah, <laughs> Joe's, yeah joe I, i've spent quite a bit of time with joe actually i think joe and nathan yeah, did and five of... five passes with richard mccall yes yep joe, <laughs> joe's told me all about that he told me about um him being the only person who uh, had the power on his legs to draft off a truck and getting he got absolutely abused for, for doing that on five passes drafting off a truck or something <laughs> <laughs> was that so, from sailing or um doing the five passes or no him being that strong in the legs <laughs> dude's just got another gear eh? yeah like um you know the normal person's got five years the, mm. the uh, high performance athlete tends to have six and joe's just got seven or eight like it's it's unreal what's, what's interesting about joe is he's always had that i remember andrew telling me about and they used to call him wingnut because of his ears right. like at marty he's just he's crazy shit like finish one race right down on the start and no, no, sorry. Win one race, yeah. Then row back down to the start, and then and win the next one. It's, it's unreal. Like he's, change boats on the side of the, of the lake. He's <laughs> just so, he's so strong. He just can just push himself. I, yeah, I don't know, yeah. But we we spend we spend a bit of time lately doing you know, some coastal rowing together, and we even went over to the World Champs last year again. again um, Coghlan Foundation supported, which was yeah, you know, brilliant. Um, and um, Joe and I, I've. I was I've been I've been two years retired at that point and, and Joe uh, a couple of years out of sailing I think as well and and Jesus he's still got it <laughs> it's been you know ten years sorry t- yeah ten years since he was rowing and he's still yep. just jumps in a boat and one month training camp and I think he got you know he got a, a, a fourth to eighth finish on the in the coastal at the World Champs yeah. I don't know. I don't know how he does it, to be honest. But it's he's bloody good fun to row it. Yeah, unfortunately, as I said, the Paddy McInnes episode got lost to the ether. We talked about coastal rowing, and he clarified it's not togs up the bum. You've got to you've got to slide. No, there's no vaseline in coastal rowing. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, it's 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 very similar to a rowing setup. Yeah, you got you got to slide, yeah, even like down to like the you know the the, the measurements and the biomechanics of. Of coastal, it's sim- it's almost the same as, as flat water rowing. Yeah, um, but it's in the ocean. And there's a running component. And there's a running component. I'm trying to get Makata into it. But she won't. Yeah. She won't do it. Yeah. It's just, the, off- the deal she's got must be too good. Yeah. yeah. Fair enough. And they're all coxed or no? Um, it's so it's, it's coming into the Olympics for LA. Mm-hmm. Um, there is a coxed event, but not for the Olympics. Mm-hmm. So similar to rowing, how there's a bunch of events that are not Olympic events. Um, the coxed mixed quad mm-hmm. is not Olympic, and then the three Olympic events are men's solo. They don't, they're not calling them singles. Men's solo, women's solo, and mixed double. Mm-hmm. First mixed, mixed. Is the Olympic event for rowing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That'd be interesting. Which um, we're actually doing quite well at that at the moment. Yeah. Um, our our lightweights Matt Dunham and Jackie Kittle won that at World Champs mm-hmm. last year. So. One, one last question there, Michael. The the New Zealand folklore that is the boss rooster. Yeah. Yeah. You you got to paint it blue, eh? I painted it blue twice while it was the traditional cops four. Yeah. And I th- think three times when it was the straight four, I transitioned and yeah. it was there from cops to. But you guys were already holding it, and you put another coat on, did? You? Yeah, we just, we just put a, a thicker coat of paint. Yeah. 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 I'd, I'd love to see a cross section of that thing one day. Yeah, I, I reckon. Yeah, so I, I similar, not the same night after the 
eight, but the next time I was staying up at Jensen's, I woke up like I was sitting up in the landing, and sure enough, I was sleeping right next to the next blue and white box rooster. Box rooster. <laughs> the blue rooster in the face. Yeah. So, uh, can you explain the rules of of why you need to paint it? <laughs> sure. So, yeah, it's it's a good event um, and for for the tradition around it. So, yeah, traditionally Cox Ford now straight ball. Yeah. Um, the uh, the winner of that race um, is awarded the trophy, and within one hour of completing the race, so you better hope your podium's not delayed. Within one hour of completing that race. The roost needs to be painted in your club colours, um, and so usually, if you expect that you might be in the running to to win that, uh, you'll have a spray can with your club's colours or multiple colours uh, at the ready. Yeah. Because if you do not have it painted within one hour of it being um, of your race, you must shout a keg to uh, the rest of the field on yeah. the finals night, and it's usually on the last. Oh, it's on the last day that race. So. Yeah. Um, so you don't want to be. <laughs> You don't want to be late to paint that, um, but the other the other uh, thing that occurs with with that event is usually people will try and steal it. Yeah. So you spoke about the Irish guys at the start. Um, they raced us in that four one year that, that we won it, and they um, they tried stealing it off us, and ended up being a I think like a, a thrown in the lake WWE style with some with the Irish guys to to <laughs> stop them stealing our, our, our blue rooster. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I mean that's the rules around it. Um. Uh, and yeah, and I mean, there's, there's some small other technical stuff as well. So you, you have to race in, in the career speed all one club. Yeah. Um, unlike other prem events. So. Nice. Yeah, and so um, yeah, we're actually going for that again this year. You as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to jump in that one. Nice. Yeah, I had a chat with um, Matt McDonald and and um, some of the other guys mm-hmm. last week. Work it. Yeah. Yeah. Doing a little bit of training, <laughs> I should be doing. More. Is that why there was? I, uh, did, I did a half an hour, an hour yeah. before you showed up. So oh, good stuff. The numbers are comparable to. And that's um, always on on the track. To under seventeen, me. Um, no, it's mine and Joe's coastal wars. Oh right, um, yeah, yeah. Gary Reed from Concept Two's been very, very generous in supporting. Like um, supporting that, so. Nice. Yeah, I also like it a lot. Yeah, yeah it is look good. Yeah. Yeah. People ask questions, I can talk about myself. <laughs> yeah, I actually got a little bit gold. <laughs> Do you want to see it? It's in the glove box. <laughs> I don't get any special treatment at home because she's got one as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So hopefully this has given people a bit of an insight, one into rowing, but two into what was an epic journey of, of the eight. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'll also put links in the show notes about... Uh, the Tony O'Connor documentary and, and Sean's talk because they're both pretty valuable pieces of yeah of uh, video. <laughs> yeah, Sean does a, does a great job of um, I guess telling the story of the eight through his lens. Yeah. Um, where, when I went into the pier, Sean stayed in the eight, um, and so he he experienced lower lows than I did, even even though I had injuries. And, and yeah. That, and that Tony Docker is brilliant as well. Tony's an exceptional human. Didn't really talk about him yeah. today, but. Um, we talk about them plenty in the docker, so that's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> nice, Michael. Thank you very much. Where do people find you? Are you pretty um, out there? Yeah, uh, Instagram for me. Um, yeah. You'll probably find me on Michaela's TikTok as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, or um, I'll be firing up the LinkedIn this year. I'm, I'm looking to, to tell my story a bit more, yeah. um, similar to Sean, and, and, and do, a bit, do a bit more speaking, hopefully, and, and share the story. Wicked. Um, so in the, the next couple of months, I'll be trying to be a bit more active on LinkedIn. Yeah. Um, where did you do Unyoked? Uh, that's where I proposed to Michaela. Oh, right. Mm, yeah. Um, in August last year. Uh, we Unyoked has been, been great. They've they've actually just gifted us a few stays, which has been really, oh, nice. really cool. Uh, we did one out by Waihe. Uh-huh. Um, that was awesome. There's a, they had a nice hot tub out there, and it's just in the middle of the bush. It's dead quiet. Mm-hmm. And very off the grid. That's that's the whole vibe for anyone that, that doesn't know unyoked. It's it's get away from the busyness of, of life, switch off. Um, the two times I've gone, of well, the second time um, was the engagements. But the first time I put my phone on the shelf, and it's the first time I think in probably almost ten years that I haven't touched my phone for twenty four hours, mm-hmm. um, and just put the phone down. And geez, it was it was wonderful. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, we did Waihee and, and we did the engagement one in Raglan. Nice. Yeah, which was overlooking the coast. It was beautiful. 
fantastic. So my last question then, Michael, and you, and you probably need it because you've done some mind-numbing things. What keeps you in flow? Um, what do you have a mantra or a way you live your life or a quote or something that shows up when things are going well or if you're in a tough spot, you call on it? Um, what keeps me in flow? I... Um it's actually, actually, it's relatively simple for me. I, I thought it was complex, complicated <laughs> for a long time. Um, but what keeps me in flow is is actually just checking things off. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm a, I'm, re I'm, a, I'm really a, a to do lister and a checklister. And even you know, I, I've been working on my you know, my habits mm -hmm. um, lately, and, and specifically daily habits. Um, and I'll checklist them. Um, and I find when I'm in a bit of a hole um, and had a bit of that after sport um, as you know, a lot of people do when they're transitioning from, from one area to another. Um, I found that, that the, the, the habits and, um, and my to-dos and um, anything checklisted uh, was one of the best things for getting me uh, out of, you know, what do you call the opposite of flow state? Out of, out of, <laughs> out of, out of a funk into into something because I, I'd I'd start writing down easy things, mm -hmm. you know, and I'd, and I might be able to check off even my daily habits, you know. Now, like um, the first four things on my daily habits, are, are, I can check them off within a minute, mm -hmm. and it just starts the day. I, I've ticked off four things, and, and I feel good about it, and, I, and I'm away. Um, but then when when I'm really in flow state, I've got my big things, and I and I and, and having the checklist structures done. And then I go, okay, that's what I have to do. And if it feels a bit overwhelming or, or complex, then I break a big point into a bunch of smaller points. And um, I, I, I don't know why. I just get a lot out of I get a lot out of doing. I mm. think. Um, and so being able to tick something off gives me that feeling that I've done done something. So that kind of keeps me in my flow state. Brilliant. Thanks, Michael. We'll wrap that up. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers.